let's continue. So microscopes it is, and while we are doing microscopes, um, what I'll try and cover in this little episode is to have an appreciation of the different microscopes that can be used to uh, create uh, magnified biological images, um, and then being able to recognize the different types of images that they are produced. So the first thing is um, the different microscope technologies, and the second thing is being able to recognize those images, being able to compare the different microscopes and the technologies that they have, advantages, disadvantages, etc. And then moving forward in, and I'm try, I'll try and keep these episodes on a daily basis, so what we'll do in each episode will be quite contained. Um, and then moving forward, we'll go on to uh, magnification, calculating magnification using the IPS graticule, etc., etc. Okay, so let's begin. So cell structure then. So in in this part of uh, the specification or this biological context is really about cell structure, okay? And the idea that the things that we know about cell structure ultimately come from microscopes. Okay, so what biology is a lot about understanding the structure of biological tissues, cells, organisms, understanding that those uh, structures are related to functions, so microscopes tells us about structures. Structures are uh, adapted to perform functions. And that's the key thing, that once, once you know structures, you can relate to functions, and essentially, that's biology. That is biology, and so what we begin with, even though it's not my favorite thing in the world, it's not the thing that I'm the most expert on, However, we do begin with microscopes because that is what gave us the, the window into biological structures and systems and functions. So let's begin. Okay, so we begin with the function of microscopes. And by the way, in the link I have um, in the description of the video, there is a link to the slides that I'm using here. So um, to allow me to do annotations and scribbles, um, I'm using a static version of this, but you can you have got the live version of this in the link um, in the description of the video. So please please do use that, and I'll be adding to that as we go along. Um, functions of microscopes, all right. And I know I'm doing a lot of introduction, but what I want you to get the most use out of this is as as I've been teaching biology, I I, I do understand that a lot comes down to revision. So what I've done with these slides is I've tried to format everything into kind of bite-sized little sections where each slide is, for example, each slide should be roughly a flashcard's worth of information. And each slide is something that I would like you to remember or ha have a grasp of in, in totality in general. So being able to knock these four points out about generally being able to describe the function of microscopes, you should be able to do that, okay? And I could easily see that being a question in an exam. So let's begin. Okay, so the function of microscopes is to produce magnified images of biological material. So this, the example of Robert Hooke and others who, at, when the technology of the microscopes was first created, they use these microscopes to look at biological material and doing so allowed them to see the structure of these uh, biological materials. Okay, so the, the way that happened was these microscopes produced magnified images and these magnified images allowed us to see the structure of living organisms. So Robert Hooke, when he looked at the um, cork of these oak tree barks, then he saw that the material, though no longer living, was organized in these uh, compartmentalized uh, structures. Okay, now these he called cells, and that 
formed the beginnings of the cell theory that tissues, biological materials, bio, you know, organisms, living organisms, living matter, was built using these cells. Okay. So, um, in my linked into the PowerPoint, which you have access to via the video description, um, there are put in various links, uh, videos that you might uh, find interesting. Uh, this is one of them. So this is a video. You can go and watch it. I'm not going to play it for you here. But it, it overviews the main discoveries of the cell theory. Okay? The cell theory has three parts, and you do need to know this. The cell theory... Uh, some of, these part, some of these points do seem a little bit overlapping, but the idea being that plant and animal tissue is composed of cells. So microscopes allowed us to uh, determine this. That plant and animal tissue is composed of cells. Remember guys, any questions, anything that I say that doesn't make sense or you want me to elaborate on it, do use the comment section. This is the whole point. Otherwise, it would, be, you know, it would be quite um, straightforward for me to just prepare these as videos. But the, the point being that to simulate a classroom experience, you can use the comment section, ask questions if you need to. Um, plant and animal tissue is made of cells. Cells are the basic unit of all life. And the third one, that cells form from pre-existing cells. So, there we have the cell theory. Okay, now, how microscopes work. Now, this is where we start to go into the different types of microscopes. But I thought that it might help to understand the general principle of all microscopes, um, and then we start to be, be more specific about each, different types of, uh, each of the different types of microscopes. So, in, in general terms, the way microscopes work is that there is some way to um, mag magnify the image based on some excitation. Okay, so you have to illuminate the sample, and we're going to come back to this. Uh, right, so you've got your sample. I don't have any space to write here, but you've got your sample. That's the first aspect of it, and and the different types of microscopes will have different uh, types of samples and the different ways that these samples have to be prepared. The next aspect you have is illumination, like what is being used to excite the sample or to make the sample visible. Okay, um, And the next, the other part is the image that's being produced. So obviously they all carry out magnification and as far as I remember they all use some method of um, uh, lenses and refraction to cause magnification. So we'll, we'll put that as a different section. So we've got magnification and I'll also put in resolution. Okay, so we've got the sample, we have the, the nature of the illumination of the sample, we have the magnification part of it, so they've all got specific magnification and resolution, and finally we have the image that is produced from the uh, from the whole process. Now, it's what I'm generalizing here is for all the different types of uh, microscopes that we need to know, and we can start talking about them here. So we have the light microscope. We are going to have the electron microscopes, both scanning and transmission, and finally we will have the confocal laser scanning microscope. Okay, so we've got these three or four, if you consider that the electron microscope has got two types or two variations of them, uh, but you have these three microscopes and for each one of these you have to know the nature of the types of samples that they accept, how to prepare them, the uh, the mechanism of the illumination, so what's the basic uh, mechanism by which uh, that unique microscope works, um, how the magnification is carried out and the extent to which that can happen and uh, the extent of its resolution and finally being able to recognize the images that are the different types of images that are produced by the different microscopes. 
Okay, um, so let's move on. Before we proceed too much further though, we do need to differentiate these two terms, which is magnification and resolution. So magnification is how much, so you, if we have a leaf, for example, okay, we put it through our microscope and the image comes out the other side. Okay, how much bigger the image is than the actual thing, that's magnification. But if we look down here, I've tried to um, show you what two different resolutions might look like. So in these two images, we are looking at the same thing. We are looking at the stomata of a leaf. And the top image is a light microscope image. Don't know if that's better. Okay, the top image is a light microscope image. And the bottom image is a scanning electron micrograph. Okay, um, now, even though size-wise they're both the same, so we could, like for our general purposes here, we could say that the magnification of these two images is the same. However, what we could also see is that there is much more detail visible in the lower image than the upper image even though the upper image is showing us different type of information, we can see that the lower image is much more detailed. We can see a lot more things. We can differentiate a lot more uh, points in the bottom image. Okay, so magnification and resolution are two different things. So that's very, very important to remember. So um, in terms of definition, we've discussed magnification, but the resolution specifically is the extent to which two separate points can be uh, differentiated. Okay, that's the resolution. And resolution, we're going to refer to resolution quite a bit. We are going to refer to higher resolution, but higher resolution, um, the higher resolution means that two points can be closer together and we can still tell them apart. That's the key point there. So, um, but the distance two points can be apart um, and, and be before they uh, kind of become not visible as two points, that is a distance measurement. And the lower the distance, so if we've got a, a resolution of 0.2 nanometers, for example, we're going to call that quite a high resolution. But if we have, um, if we have, uh, a resolution of let's say 200 nanometers we are going to refer to that as a low resolution because our ability to resolve those points is lower okay um, so I hope that makes sense um, again let me know if anything needs further uh, clarification so let's talk about light microscopy then so in light microscopy, the samples are prepared on slides. The illumination, remember those four categories that we're going to use to compare our different microscopes. The first category was illumination, and the thing that is used to illuminate in light microscopy is visible, visible light. Okay, the light has to pass through the sample. Right, so kind of looking in this direction, so the light is moving up here. Okay, um, the light has to move through the sample. Once it moves through the sample, it is refracted through lenses, the objective lens. And once it is refracted, the magnification has happened. So we're kind of here now, kind of in this area right here, and then once the let's zoom in a little bit, um, and in order to focus the, in order to um, re, in order to refract the light again, it passes through more lenses in order to make the image visible 
to the viewer through the eyepiece lens. Okay, so that's what we have there in terms of the right microscope. Okay, so if we just look at some examples of images produced by light microscopy, then we'll, have, we'll be able to uh, talk about a few things also. So the first thing is that light microscopy gives us information about color. Okay. So we can see that from these images that we can get information regarding color. So some of those colors are real, so it can show the real color of the samples. But in some cases, we can use stains to increase the contrast of what we're looking at to make the things that we are looking for uh, more visible, okay? So make the structures more visible. And that's where staining comes in, okay? So staining is the process by which we increase the contrast because if we look at this example of an onion uh, cell under a light microscope we can see that there's not a lot of contrast in the image so there's a little bit of color this must have been a red onion um, so there's a little bit of pigmentation in the cells but it's not easy to uh, see the nucleus we might be able to identify it but it's not easy to see it um, it's, you know, we can't see any of the other structures either because naturally cells don't have high contrast. It would be great if the Golgi apparat apparatus and the endoplasmic reticulum and the nucleus and the lysosomes, it would be great if they all naturally had different colors, but they don't. And because they don't, we have to go through the process of staining. Okay, so staining Please remember, staining is ultimately done to increase the contrast, to increase the contrast between the different structures so that we can start to get more information regarding uh, being able to A, identify structures, and B, uh, be able to uh, compare the different structures in different uh, cell types. Okay, so what's the, what's the principle behind staining? Okay. So the first one we've covered is that the contrast, natural contrast of cells is quite low to discriminate these uh, different structures. So what we can do is add chemical stains. Not, now these chemical stains have two important properties that I would like you to remember. The first one is that they are pigmented, so they have a color um, of their own, which we are using to increase the contrast of our images. Secondly, they, because of their chemical properties, they have a tendency to bind some components more than other components. Okay, and we'll, we'll have a look at an example of those things. But because of those two things, we can start to identify or, or be able, first we're able to see different structures, okay, because they are binding them and they have a natural pigmentation, a natural color that we can uh, visualize through the magnified image. Secondly, we can start to see the structure of the thing that they are binding to. Okay, so that's two very important things. So it, uh, it allows us to see the structure in the first place, but it also allows us to see the structure of the thing that it's binding to. Okay. And because of that, it allows organelles, cells, and tissues to be identified, to be analyzed, and compared. So those are the kind of things that you'll be doing in an exam situation. Okay, so now let's look at the nature of these different um, stains. Wow, my voice is good. All right, guys. So let's continue. So um, the, with regards to the stains, there's a, a, quite a bit of information that one could go into. What I've decided to do is just give you some um, examples of the different types of situations that you could be in looking at uh, different types of cells. So in the first instance, we've got bacteria. We can stain bacteria up, and what's the information that we can get 
from bacteria. Uh, next, we have animal cells. What kind of information uh, can we get from animal cells? And these are all things that have um, connections to other points in the specification. Um, so they are going to come up again at some point, so it's important to know these. Um, and then finally, plant cells. Okay, so we've got bacteria, prokaryotic cells, we've got animal cells, and we've got plant cells. Okay. Um, right, so let's begin. So the first stain is the gram stain. And the gram stain is a mixture of two different things. Um, it is It has got crystal violet um, and also something else which I can't remember. Um, but crystal violet is the actual dye that's going to highlight the color uh, in, in this, uh, that, that's going to be used to see the cell shape. But why would you want to stain bacteria in the first place? And the point is this, is that different types of bacteria have different types of shapes. So you can get spherical bacteria called cocci, you can have rod-shaped cells like what E. coli is, you can even have spiral bacterial cells. So in order to be able to see these cells, Naturally, these cells have low contrast, remember, and it's difficult to see them. But if they were to take up a dye, and we're able to visualize these cells a bit more clearly, as in this diagram right here, we can see that this uh, bacterial mixture contains both uh, spherical bacteria and a rod-shaped bacteria. And that can be useful to um, people who, who want to identify which bacteria might be present in um, maybe a soil sample or maybe even a, a biological, physiological sample. Okay, so anyway, how does this work? So the dye, crystal violet, that's the, that's the pigment, but the crystal violet is able to enter cells. Crystal violet is able to enter cells, but it is only retained by bacterial cells that have a cell wall with a particular structure. So you can get gram-positive bacteria that have a, a cell wall that has a thicker layer of peptidoglycan, and you can have gram-negative cells that have a much thinner layer of peptidoglycan. Okay, peptidoglycan, remember, is a mixture of amino acids and uh, carbohydrate, so it's protein and carbohydrate. Um, and because of this difference in structure, cells which are gram-positive retain the dye inside the cell, so the crystal violet accumulates, making them look purple. But cells which are gram-negative, the crystal violet can easily uh, remove, uh, exit the cell, and those cells don't appear as purple, okay? And then they are counter-stained with safranin, which is a red dye, and then the red dye is incorporated into those cells. So the, the cells which have this gram-positive, or the cells which appear purple, we can get the information about what kind of cell wall structure they have, whereas the cells which appear a bit more pink, less purple, we can infer from that that they have a cell wall with a different structure. So we are able to get structural information on the basis of differential staining. Okay, so moving on. So remember two things, cell shape and cell wall structure for bacteria. Next, moving on to animal cells. So the example of the animal cells is going to be a blood smear. Okay, so these um, stains can also be used to, to differentiate um, cells in the blood. Okay, so this is what blood would look like under a light microscope up here. Okay, so you can see it's just to um, reinforce the point that normally um, biological samples have low contrast and we need to do things to help us A, see the stuff in the first place, and B, get a bit more structural information about what we're looking at. 
So in that's a blood smear at the top, but then what you can do is use differential stains. But the stains that you use for a blood smear are not the same as the ones that you'd use for a ground stain. Um, and so you have chemical stains that bind to particular components. So in this case, what we have are methylene blue, okay, which we can which is methylene blue would be this one right here. And methylene blue binds to negatively charged things. Now, one of the most negatively charged things that you might find in a cell are the nucleic acids. Remember the sugar phosphate backbone of the um, nucleic acids mean that uh, nucleic acids, RNA, DNA, are highly negatively charged. And so methylene blue appearing blue but also having this nice convenient positive charge binds to negatively charged DNA that one might find in the nucleus. Okay, and E is in red, is this guy right here, being negatively charged, tends not to bind DNA, binds other uh, positively charged things, generally speaking, hangs around and binds to things in the cytoplasm. So both of these will have the cytoplasm right there. But then we can start to see why the nucleus is in particular staining up dark blue and relatively speaking the cytoplasm is much less blue because it's binding the methylene blue much less. Okay, um, And so similarly we can then start to see that A, some cells have nucleus and some cells don't, which fits in with our understanding of red blood cells because red blood cells have no nucleus. Okay, um, they have cytoplasm, and so there's the, these cells right here, these all red blood cells, cytoplasm, ears in red, binding those cytoplasmic components, making sense. Okay, however, in the cells with a nucleus, all right, we obviously the nucleus is staining up quite dark, there's DNA there, so we can see that there is a nucleus present. We can also see not only that the nucleus is there, but the different structure of the nuclei in these different cells. And the fact that the nucleus takes up a different um, structure in these different cell types. Okay, and then we can relate that to function when we find out more about function. But that's the point of these differential stains in animal cells. Moving on, differential stains in plant cells. So the one that we use quite a lot in plant cells is toluidine blue. Toluidine blue. Now toluidine blue, there can be other ones that are used, but the, this is also a positively charged uh, molecule and it will bind to DNA. And if you've done the practical, or at some point you will, um, you know that it's used to stain the DNA or, of the cells in a root, for example, or a root tip, and if there are any cells which are undergoing mitosis, because those chromosomes are condensed, the dye itself is also condensed, and therefore we can see um, that certain cells are undergoing mitosis, whereas other ones might not be. Okay? Cool. Any questions so far? Don't forget to leave a question, um, otherwise I'll just ramble on, which I have no problem in doing. Um, so let's continue. Uh, right, we will do, shall we do the slide preparation? Right, so sticking with light microscopy then, there are different ways that you can prepare your slides. Um, the most simple being a dry mount, Okay, so in this case, you just take a little bit of your dry sample, some soil, some hair, some fur, whatever. Okay, you stick it on a microscope slide, cover it with a cover slip, and off you go. You can start looking 
at what you have. It's important to note, or maybe just slightly interesting, that that's probably how Robert Hooke first viewed the um, oak cork that was used to make his sketches of what cells uh, might look like. Um, so that, that would have been a dry mount. Okay. Next, wet mount. Right now, when you have aquatic or living samples, this is the thing that you might be using. Okay, so you have your sample and you place it within a drop of liquid on the slide right there. Okay, um, and once you have your cells or whatever they are within the liquid, um, then you place a cover slip on top of the liquid just to flatten it out, make it as thin a layer as possible so that it's more um, transmissible for the light. Okay, so you've got a drop of liquid, um, slide that is placed at an angle, so that's right there, gently lowered, flatten it out, and then you see things like uh, maybe aquatic organisms or maybe some cells that you have um, in liquid. Okay, next, smear slides. So that's when you have, for example, a blood sample. You want to have a thin as possible layer of cells. Um, so you put a drop there. You spread that liquid out up, up along the edge of your cover slip. That's the next point right there. And then you kind of go in the reverse direction and just spread it out. Okay, and that is very important to get a thin layer of cells as thin as possible so that you can make maybe some kind of quantitative analysis about how many or the density of the cells. Okay, right, squash slides is another example. Okay, so this is the kind of thing that you might be doing when analyzing mitosis. Um, so you've got some root tissue, for example, but you can't just look at that straight down a microscope because all your cells will be overlapping each other. You won't know what you're looking at. So a squash, in a similar way to smear, but a smear is a way when you, when you already have separate cells in a liquid medium, that's when a smear is applicable. But a squash, you, already, you have this tissue, um, in th like three-dimensional tissue, and you need to spread those cells out. Okay, now there's, there's things that you can do to allow those cells to diso dissociate a bit from, the, from each other. But once you've done that, so for example, treating with hydrochloric acid, once you've done that, you place the um, tissue on a slide. You've got the tissue on a slide, okay? And you place the cover slip on top with an, with an aim to kind of squash it down a little bit, apply some pressure to spread these, spread the three-dimensional tissue into a, a, as close to a single layer of cells as possible. And when you do that, then you can start to make a bit more sense of uh, what, what you're seeing. Hopefully the staining works as you can see here. Okay, so to summarize, to summarize about light microscopy is that samples can be living or dead, okay? So light microscopy has that unique feature and light microscopy and the very closely related confocal microscopy both allow samples to be living, okay? They, to some extent, they can display the actual colors of the samples, okay? now. That doesn't mean that we can't enhance the contrast by using stains, but if there is an inherent color in the sample that you're looking at, light microscopy will allow you to see that. Um, samples can be prepared in different ways. However, it's a relatively simple preparation uh, compared to the other microscopes, which we'll see in a bit. Uh, the contrast can be enhanced by differential staining. Um, as can confocal, actually they all can, 
uh, use some form of differential staining. Um, the maximum magnification is around 1000 times. Now, depending on the source that you use, whichever textbook or wherever, there's loads of different numbers in regards to what's the ma maximum magnification of an electron microscope or what's the mag maximum magnification of a light microscope. What I would suggest is that you have a ballpark figure, but mainly remember the order. So in order of magnifications, light microscopy is right at the bottom, okay? Um, with confocal in terms of magnification, then we've got the electron microscopes above that, okay? Um, maximum resolution of around 200 nanometers. So again, that's the lowest of the microscopes. It's relatively inexpensive, small, and portable. So you guys should have used a microscope at this point. Um, you know that they're relatively straightforward to use. Obviously, they can come in a wide, wide range of levels of technology, okay? But generally speaking, light microscopes are much smaller and more portable compared to electron microscopes and all the technology that's associated with them. Let us move on to electron microscopy now. So, electron microscopy then, um, in this case, the illumination source, remember, we're, we're finding the common features so that we can make comparisons more easy, okay? Um, the illumination source is electrons. Not visible light, not lasers, electrons, okay? Now, in general terms, we'll, we will go into a little bit of detail regarding electron mi uh, scanning electron microscopes versus transmission electron microscopes, but generally speaking, electrons hit the sample, the sample does some funky stuff to the electrons, the electrons either come out the other side and you know, maybe deflected in some way, so it's the deflection that allows us to, or the intensity of the electrons coming out the other side that allows us to differentiate so this, what the sample did and make an image. Okay, or it might just bounce off the top of the sample. So if we're relying on the electrons to be transmitted through the sample to make the image, that's transmission electron microscopy. But if we're relying on the electrons to be bouncing off the surface of the sample, that is scanning electron microscopy, generally speaking, right there. Okay, but long story short, electrons are the illumination um, sample does something to the electrons, the electrons are detected on the other side, and it's the detection of the electrons on the other side that allows the image to be created. Okay, now because electrons have a much uh, shorter wavelength than visible light, um, they can have much higher magnification without the concurrent loss of resolution that you might expect. Okay. Um, you know yourself, like, just zooming into this image, at some point we start to lose resolution, as we can clearly see, okay? But with electron microscopy, you can magnify much more without losing the resolution, okay? And that's, that's the point there. However, because the electrons are either there or not there, and you don't get different types of electrons, it's just the electrons, and because of that, your image is only ever going to be black and white, or grayscale, however you want to call it, okay? Because it's, it's, whereas visible light can be of different wavelengths, and therefore you can get different colors, electrons are either there or they're not there, or there's a high intensity or a low intensity, but, um, yeah, there's no color information that is possible from electron microscopes, okay? That doesn't mean, and I know this can be confusing, but you can get some false color images of, my, uh, of electron microscopy, so please watch out for that. Um, but those, they should be called false color images, because they've been colored afterwards, maybe using a best guess, um, educated guess of a scientist or some, 
in some way, but those are false color images. The color has been added afterwards. Okay, now sample preparation. Now, electron microscopes, um, they, they do give us excellent images, okay? However, the way the electron microscope technology works, the sample, like a living sample, you put that in an in a electron microscope, first of all, there's really high temperatures, okay, because of the beam of electrons that are used, and secondly, it has to be done in a vacuum. Vacuum doesn't have two seats. Okay, so it has to be done in a vacuum. Now, any living material does not, it does not stay living in that situation, and B, it goes through great amounts of distortion. So a living sample placed directly into a, an electron microscope um, would be completely obliterated by that process, to the point where it's no longer having any point to look at it, that information anymore. So, you've got to do some things to make sure that that sample can stay intact and it, even while not being alive, can still give us valuable structural information about the stuff. In order to do that, you have to put the samples through a quite complex preparation process. Okay, so first of all, you've got to treat them with chemicals that kind of glues everything together, called fixatives. Okay, now these chemically link molecules next to each other so that they can't move. Okay, and they're fixed in their positions, thereby retaining their structure. Um, that could involve freezing and some harsh chemicals. Right, next, as we've said, um, it has to be done in a vacuum. Uh, water uh, needs to be removed. Um, and also, samples need to be stained with heavy metals, because just like um, living tissues have low contrast in visible light, guess what? Living tissues also quite uncooperative with deflecting or messing around with electron beams. So, heavy metals are added to help the tissues to be able to deflect these electrons or adjust their path or uh, reflect them or whatever. Okay, so heavy metals are added to increase um, the ability of the tissue to cause changes to the path of electrons. So, doesn't need to be said, but I'll say it anyway. This is a complex process and can result in a little bit of distortion. So you're going to do all this stuff to living tissue. You can't ex be expecting to do that and and expect to preserve the tissue 100% as it was when it was living. So you've got to take that with a little pinch of salt. So even though you're getting all this cool information regarding um, high resolution and high magnification images, you've got to take it with a pinch of salt that what you're looking at might be a little bit affected by the process you had to put that living sample through. Okay, moving on then. So the disadvantages of the electron microscope are that sample preparation is complex. We've discussed that the process itself can maybe change a few things so that what you're looking at might not represent what the cell actually looked like in life. Um, electron microscopes are big and are not mobile as compared to a light microscope. They are expensive to run and maintain. Um, samples have to be dead. Okay, You can't look at what a living sample looks like. And images are always false color. Okay, So there we have the disadvantages of the electron microscopes, generally speaking. Okay, So how? what do these images look like? What are the different images that are produced by these different forms of microscopes? What do they look like? So we've had a look at some of the light microscope images. And I hope that when we did that, you're making a note about what it is that defines a image from a light microscope and what it is that says to you that that is a, a scanning electron microscope or a transmission electron microscope. So let's look at that. So as we've said, that transmission electron microscopy is about the electrons that made it through a sample. 
Okay. Now, because of that, these images will always be two-dimensional in their information that they're providing to you. Okay. So, like this, you can see that there's there's no shadows, there's no three-dimensional information. The best way to do this is if I go back up here to compare these two images. So if I change back over here, so this is a transmission electron microscope image up here. Okay, and this is a scanning electron microscope image down here. As we can see here, this is all 2D, right? It's just black and white information in two dimensions. There's a lot of information, a lot of detail, high magnification. The lower image, lower magnification, um, and it's the surface information of the cells that we are getting. Um, but we are getting nice three-dimensional information here. So I hope you can see the different types of images that you can produce from a transmission electron microscope and a scanning electron microscope. Okay, so the transmission electron microscopy has the highest resolution of 0.5 nanometers. Images are 2D as we've discussed, um, but they can show the internal structural detail of cells. So that's important. Okay, um, but as with all electron microscope images, they are grayscale and don't have any real color information. With the scanning electron microscopy, the as you can see in this diagram here, it's all about how the electrons kind of don't go through. It's not about going through the sample. It is about being deflected off the surface of the sample. Okay, and while that doesn't give us uh, internal information, depending on how the sample is being prepared and what what the meaning of internal is. Um, but in this case, you can get some really nice, high-resolution, high-magnification images of the surface detail of biological material. Okay, so there we have that. So generally speaking, um, it's about the electrons deflected off the surface of the sample. The magnification is slightly lower than tra uh, transmission electron microscope, so please remember that. And remember that it's I wouldn't advise kind of memorizing a specific number unless it's from an endorsed textbook. But what might be more useful is that you generally remember the comparative positions of these microscopes. Um, the resolution is also lower than transmission electron microscopes, but we do get 3D information. Okay. Finally. Finally. Laser scanning confocal microscopy. Now, I don't think you need to know in this case how this works, but you do need to recognize the images that it produces. But we'll we'll have a little bit of discussion of the theory anyway. Um, these are produced. So the illumination source in this case is lasers. Okay. So we had light with light microscopes. We had electrons in electron microscopy and in laser scanning from focal microscopy, it's lasers. It's a it's a close relative to light microscope in many ways. Okay, so lasers are the illumination source, um, high concentration, extremely parallel beams of energy. Um, but what that means is. Because there's not a lot of wavelengths, and because all these um, beams are extremely parallel, what that means is, whereas in a light microscope, you could get light at various levels through the sample, various levels and depths producing the image that we see, with confocal, let's have a parallel sample next door to it, with confocal, the excitation is only ever is controlled. The excitation is only ever happening at one particular level of the choosing of whoever's doing the viewing. Okay, so if I'm interested in what's happening at this point in the cell, then I can do that, I can adjust that. 
All right, which means naturally the resolution is much higher because you're not dealing with information from different depths of the cell. Okay, with confocal, you're only ever dealing with information from one specific plane in the cell, which increases the resolution and uh, clarity of the image. Okay, um, but the other thing is that a particular kind of staining process is needed in order to visualize this. So what is responding to the laser? So we're putting a laser on the cells, but what is it that is allowing us to generate the image? And what it is, is that the cells have been labeled with fluorescent markers in a way. Okay, so you've got these molecules that you've treated your sample with, and those molecules are binding to specific components of the cell. Okay, and when stimulated with the laser, these fluorophores then re emit energy of a particular wavelength which can be detected. And the energy that is detected is used to produce the image. Okay, it's kind of false color because it's not the actual thing that we're, it's not the actual component itself that's producing the energy, it's the label. And the label is a synthetic thing that you've added. Okay, so this is an example of what I mean here. So this cell, so the, this cell has got fluor, it's, a, it's got a marker that fluorescently binds tubulin and fluoresces green. Okay, so you've got a label which binds tubulin, which remember, tubulin is what microtubules are made of. So all the microtubules in the cell, the cytoskeleton, or at least one part of it. So this label is binding the microtubules. The label is then being excited with the laser, and then the label is fluorescing green. So wherever we get a green signal, it's showing us uh, the presence of microtubules. Okay, um, it's also the red part here is, so you've got a, another molecule which is binding to histone proteins, okay, which are binding the DNA in the nucleus. So the histone proteins are in the nucleus, and wherever the histone proteins are, we get a red signal. So we put that together and we get this image that A shows us where the histones are and what arrangement and structure they have, um, but it also tells us the location and organization of microtubules. So you don't see everything, but what you do see is an incredibly high resolution and magnification. Okay, so uh, confocal microscopy allows you to label specific cellular components, so it's not everything that you're seeing. Um, they can be fixed, static images, or, or um, and if you've got access to the slides, you can see a little video of this. Um, samples can be living, so you can see how living, live microtubules behave um, in real time, um, which is cool. Okay, so those are our different microscopes, ladies and gents, and I think that brings me to a close for this lesson. Um, what we'll do next time is, let's just go back to the specification here, okay, um, so we've done staining in microscopy and identifying different components, we have now done the different types of microscopes, what I'll do next time is I'll recap with a little um, summary and comparison of the different types of microscopes, and then we'll move into magnification, okay, so we'll do magnification next, and then after that, we will look at the different organelles of the cell, look at their structure, connect that to their function, and go on from there. So, ladies and gents, I hope you have found this useful. Um, do drop me some feedback if you think I can change anything. This is a little bit of an experiment. Um, but yeah, uh, I hope you found this valuable. I hope you can see this working going forward. Um, and according to my plan at the moment, we should be good to go again same time tomorrow 
Um, again, also tell me if a different time is more convenient for you, um, so I can work to that. Uh, thank you guys for joining me. Uh, if you're watching this afterwards, uh, thank you for watching also. I hope you have found it useful. Give me feedback. I want this to be as useful to you as possible. Um, and yeah, whatever situation you're in, guys, please take care. Um, be informed, you know. Like, don't just listen to random things on the internet. Check your sources, as any good scientist would. Spread good information. Spread scientifically backed information.